Hello everyone, uh, my name is Henman Kim. I am the Chief of Policy at the Joint AI Center um, at the Department of Defense. Um, I want to spend my time this morning um, giving you an introduction to the Jake uh, or the Joint AI Center um, and then move into the project that we have um, started and are well in, in our way of de development and deployment uh, for COVID-19 response. So I always like to start off um, with a quote from Secretary Esper. Um, he, he said, advances in AI have the potential to change the character of warfare for generations to come. Whichever nation harnesses AI first will have a decisive advantage on the battlefield for many, many years. We have to get there first. Um, so this is really to say that AI is the biggest tech modernization priority for the department. Um, we realize it's a huge uh, challenge in front of us, um, but also a, a big opportunity um, that will not only require a lot of engagement from within the department across the um, across the government, but also with our private sector. So that brings me to the Jake. Um, the Jake was established in 2018 with the mission to accelerate the adoption and integration of AI throughout the department. Um, everything we do is sort of around five pillars. Uh, the first pillar is deliver. Um, that's our core objective. So we deliver AI-enabled capabilities that create efficiency and enable mission impact. Um, we're developing AI solutions tailored to the challenges of operational commanders. Um, and because of this, end user engagement is paramount in delivering these capabilities from concept product prototype um, to final deployment. And this is something that has been really key for us in our COVID-19 response. Second objective is scale. Everything that the Jake does is designed to generate leverage to have a positive impact at DOD. Um, DOD is a huge organization. Um, I, my previous job, I come from the Hill, um, which I sort of saw as, uh, you know, 500 something uh, small businesses running around. Um, in DOD, just the scale of the department um, has been a real, really big learning curve for me. Um, and the Jake is a very small piece of DOD, but everything we do, we have to make sure that we're being strategic with it and that we can scale, um, whether it's lessons learned or the, the capabilities that we're delivering to the warfighters. Um, so a big part of this is our joint common foundation, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, it's our infrastructure layer. Um, and once we finish building it, um, it will deliver, it will lower the technical barriers to developing high quality AI software throughout the DOD and for our industry partners as well. The third object objective is cultivate. Uh, we're recruiting, cultivating, and developing a talented workforce of AI professionals. Um, that not just come from the civilian population, but from our military, for our military personnel as well. Um, the makeup of the Jake is about half uh, civilian and half military. Um, so we work very closely with all, all the services to make sure that when our active duty members um, spend their time at the Jake, they are able to learn these digital AI product management skills that they can take back to their services as well. Um, so the wider, and this is important because the wider adoption of AI is really closely tied to a tech-centered culture um, that's focused on digital transformation and the acceleration of AI. The fourth pillar is engage. Uh, the tech industry, the traditional defense industrial base, and the academic sector all play a really critical role in national security. AI is obviously a dual-use technology, um, so this is really key for us. And the DOD really needs their support to effectively accelerate AI adoption. And the fifth pillar or objective is lead. Uh, we lead an AI ethics, safety, policy, and governance. And this is sort of my bread and butter. Um, so we, my, my policy team um, is developing the AI ethics implementation, um, a, a sort of broad range of AI policy. Um, I think whenever you talk about AI policy it means something to someone and then something different to another person. Um, but when I say AI policy, it's really any policy issue area that touches upon AI. So this can be privacy, military ethics, um, data standards, data governance, and so forth. So moving on to the next slide. 
so as I mentioned, the Jake was established in 2018. Uh, we received our full funding from Congress in March 2019. Um, on the right hand is our uh, milestone timeline. Um, and the one thing that I'll point out is that we had a big realignment in March of this year. Uh, where we reorganized the Jake to put product first and build a sales funnel, something that those in the private sector are very familiar with. Um, and this was a really big shift for us. Um, previously at the Jake, we were organized by different mission initiatives, um, which I'll get into. Uh, but our CTO, um, who is now our acting director, um, he was able to sort of imbibe the tech culture within us where um, we, we essentially um, reorganize the product and mission team and the mission team is mostly our military personnel who are out there um, being able to make sure that we have a transition partner for everything we're building um, as well as a product team who can really focus on building the core engineering and data talent that we need to be able to deliver these products. On the left hand side, you'll see some of our core guidance documents. I want to highlight the DoD AI strategy, uh, which we wrote and published in 2018. Um, this is sort of seen as a founding document for the Jake. Uh, and then fast forward to, forward to 2020, um, January of this year, Secretary Esper signed the AI ethics principles for the DoD. Um, and the Jake is positioned to be the coordinator uh, for implementation of these principles. Um, and this is um, a, a big project and priority for my policy team um, going forward into this year. So the Jake started uh, with four government employees. Um, I think mo most of us were detailees um, that we sort of begged the services uh, to loan to us. Um, and today we're 75, 75 government personnel. Um, not counting our contractors. I think once you count our contractors, um, we're probably about 160 or 170. Uh, I joined the Jake six months ago, um, and it's been incredible to see how fast not only we've grown in scale in just that time, but also how quickly we've been able to iterate on all of our products, policies, and processes. So most of the Jake's activities can be divided into three main efforts, uh, mission initiatives, the Joint Common Foundation, and strategy and policy. So our mission initiatives are all about delivering AI products to the services and combatant commands. Uh, I'll talk more about what those specific mission initiatives are, um, but this is really where we build our products. The Joint Common Foundation is our infrastructure layer, um, which we are developing on top of DoD's cloud. Um, so once JEDI kicks in, uh, this is when the JCF um, will provide the AI application layer on top of that. And then lastly, under strategy and policy, we're leading implementation of the DoD AI strategy, uh, which is that document that came out in 2018. The DoD AI governance process, uh, which includes a three-star executive steering committee, a working group, um, and a bunch of subcommittees under that that are focused on specific um, areas of AI governance, such as technical standards, test and evaluation, ethics, and so forth. Um, and broadly, for strategy policy, we, we're responsible for all the Jake and DoD policies that touch on AI. Um, so when I first started at the Jake, I started off by interviewing every mission chief about some of their biggest policy hurdles. Um, these are um, the common themes that came up were around data sharing. Um, you know, for a single project, we we might have to have a data sharing agreement uh, with seventy different data owners. Um, they're even though they're all within the Department of Defense, um, it's it's important that we have that relationship with each of the data owner, um, but obviously that is not maybe not the most efficient way to do things, um, especially when you're talking about not actually using the data for operational use or actually um, transforming the data in any way. Um, I think there there is a lot of policy work that we could be doing around data sharing, um, and how do you uh, how do you efficiently share data or give access to data for algorithm development? Um, privacy is another huge AI policy issue. Um, AI is not, uh, we can't develop AI without, without having a lot of data. Um, and I think, I think the biggest hurdle when it comes to AI development and privacy is that sometimes you can't 
you don't know what that data is going to do exactly to that algorithm. Um, most of our federal privacy regime is sort of rooted in uh, you take in as little data as you need to do what you really need to do. Um, and that, that's that been a hard thing for us to sort of um, uh, navigate um, as we're making sure that we're building privacy first and foremost into all of our data, data aggregation um, and algorithm development. A uh, couple of other quick things, acquisition and personnel um, are two other sort of common themes that keep coming up. Um, and all of this is to really say that we have a wide portfolio, um, but a congressional mandate also to transform DOD policy as well. So we, we at the Jake have six different uh, mission initiatives. Um, the first one is joint warfighting operations. Um, under joint warfighting, we have five main lines of effort. Uh, JASC2, which, which stands for Joint All Domain Command and Control, Overmatch, Joint Fires, Electromagnetic Spectrum, and Strategic Mobility. And all of these are about delivering an AI capability directly into the hands of our warfighter in the battlefield. The second is warfighter health. Um, this is where we're utilizing AI to deliver more efficient administration and record keeping, as well as improving quality of medical services uh, for our service members. Um, this is where, uh, you know, sort of the, the traditional um, telehealth applications can come in, um, but also how do we make sure that um, for military and medical ethics, how do we make sure that we can still apply AI, um, but have a um, you know, forward-leaning conversation about those ethical issues when it comes to delivering care for our warfighters. The third one is business process transformation. Um, so using AI to improve laborious processes and gain organizational efficiencies. Um, this one's probably not as sexy as joint warfighting or warfighter health, um, but it's a huge uh, payoff for our department. The fourth is threat reduction and protection. Um, this is formerly known as HATR or Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Recovery. Um, some of you might know that this is this was the Jake's first mission initiative, um, and this is all about shrinking timelines associated with sense making, resource allocation, operational execution, uh, reducing human costs, and increasing effectiveness of disaster response. Um, and this is where our COVID nineteen project fits in. The fifth is joint logistics, uh, predicting and mitigating key mechanical issues. Um, so how do we predict uh, when one of our helicopters might need maintenance? Um, uh, we've also sort of learned painfully that this is where um, uh, some, of, some of the most simple things can become the hardest in the department. Um, the way that maintenance logs are filled out are usually done by hand. Um, so we have to make sure that those things can be automated before we are able to apply AI to do predictive maintenance. And then the last one is joint information warfare, um, which is essentially cyber. So detecting advanced cyber threats in real time, identifying adversarial use of compromised accounts, and then identifying novel, novel threat activity. So moving on to Project Salas, uh, this is our COVID-19 project. Um, so Project Salas is, is named after the Roman goddess of safety and well-being. Um, it's a Jake mission to meet an uh, emerging requirements from both the US Northern Command um, as well as the National Guard in their decision making uh, as related to COVID-19. So we do this by building predictive models and then and also providing a JASC2 platform, uh, JASC2 again being joint all domain command and control. Um, we realize that we're only one piece of, I think, a much bigger response effort across the DOD and the government, um, but the Jake does bring some unique capabilities. Um, so a lot of the, the DOD's efforts when it comes to COVID-19 is one, um, First and foremost, protecting our own personnel uh, and to making sure that this doesn't hurt our readiness to go to war. Um, so Project Salas, um, we're we're working directly with North Common National Park National Guard um, in the way that they help with a lot of these um, DISC or defense defense support of civil authorities missions. Um, and we're focusing specifically on the supply chain and food distribution operations. 
And we started off by aggregating open source data, commercial data, and government data. Um, and I can't too, talk too much about our specific vendors on this, um, but we are we're really pleased with the amount of interest and the enthusiasm that some of our nation's biggest tech companies brought to us uh, when the COVID pandemic really started in the U.S. Um, I, I think the most uh, impressive thing to me about Project Salus so far is that it really went from you know. Um, chicken scratch on a napkin uh, to an MVP just in 26 days. Um, this project has been really, uh, I think, useful for the Jake because it's the first time that we have formed a, what we call an integrated project team. Um, so it's a small Jake team that has a product manager, project manager. Um, you know, I, I have a policy analyst who is working with that team. Um, my ethics lead is also part of that team. Uh, as well as a test and evaluation representative, acquisition representative. So it's a really cross-functional team for Jake. Um, uh, and not to mention a lot of our vendor and contractor support on this. So since we've started Project Salus, uh, we've delivered 40 models already, um, that, and we've used 50 plus dat data sources um, with a big focus on emerging vulnerabilities and supply demand predictive analytics. And where we're headed with Project Salus, um, COVID-19, uh, at least the military response to COVID-19 is not going to last uh, forever. Um, but what we what we really focus on building is how do we fuse um, different data sources in a really fast way? How do we make sure that um, this data is fused in a way that we can develop algorithms um, efficiently on top of that? And I think most importantly, um, how do we build a platform uh, that um, that the commander, uh, whether it's commander of the Northcom or National Guard or um, a local officer, how do we make sure that all of that information and the predictions that we are um, trying to develop on top of it, how do we make sure that that is directly supporting an operation and directly supporting decision making? Um, so we've learned a lot through that. We had a lot of user engagement interviews um, with our customers in this. Um, and as we look sort of in the next couple of months, um, but also year and two years forward on this, um, we think that these lessons are something that can be really applied to any Jazz 2 effort um, that will be led by the Joint Chiefs in the future. And that's it for me. Um, my, I, we don't have any time for Q&A, um, but my email uh, is on that last slide here. Um, so I'm happy to connect on uh, anything Jake um, or our Project Salus Matters. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tom Suter and I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And we have with us today, uh, Dan Bolin, Director of Federal Programs at Altair, as well as James Turbeso, Federal Solutions Specialist at Altair. How are you gentlemen doing today? Great, Tom. Thanks for having us. Well, good to have, yeah, no problem. Good to have you today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Absolutely. So thanks again, Tom, for having us. Um, and again, my name is Daniel Bolin, Director of Federal Programs for Data Analytics at Altair. Today, we're just gonna talk about a few different use cases that we have been running into recently, uh, talking with some of our federal clients, and we're gonna go over some just kind of general information about our data analytics product suite for you. So thanks for joining us, and uh, hope you find this useful. Next slide. Again, my name's Dan, as you can see there on the right. Um, we're also joined today, as Tom said, by James Turbeso. Federal Solutions Specialist. Um, I'm gonna be going through some slides today. Shouldn't take very long at all. Um, and then I'm actually gonna hand it over to James. Um, seeing is believing, and he can uh, show you live what the product looks like. As you can see there on the agenda, basically what I said, um, we'll talk a little bit about what all, who Altair is as, as a company, the solutions and use cases that uh, we provide to our federal clients, our products, and then again, a live demo at the end. Next slide. So Altair is actually a global company uh, that has thousands of employees that not only concentrate on just data analytics, but also other solutions that we provide 
uh, like high performance computing, simulation, design, and Internet of Things. Uh, we're publicly traded. Um, again, a global company headquartered in the Detroit area. Um, and we, al we actually already do have a thousand plus software assets spread across multiple different government agencies that we'll talk about today. Next slide. The Altair Data Analytics Suite boasts many different products. Uh, the ones that we'll talk about today are at the top in orange, um, and you will see all of those today. Uh, James will show them to you. Monarch, Knowledge Hub, Knowledge Studio, and Panopticon. And as you can see there below, um, some of the attributes that describe the solutions that those products provide. We do like to think of ourselves as an end-to-end -end analytics uh, suite. And what I mean by that is full spectrum analytics from data preparation to advanced analytics like predictive prescriptive analytics, AI, machine learning modeling, all the way to the end to the decision making via data visualization. Next slide. We are a well-established vendor within the federal marketplace. Um, we'll be talking about two main use cases today that revolve around criminal investigation analytics as well as maintenance analytics. Um, but as you can see there, uh, some of the other bullet points that we have listed. Um, and then on the bottom left, uh, obviously some logos that I'm sure uh, you folks are familiar with, a uh, very large, uh, very a lot of a lot of assets within the DoD. Very large customer for us, Air Force in particular, which uh, James will will touch on, um, and then Federal Financial too is very large. So um, FDIC and, and IRS, as you can see there as well. But uh, definitely uh, many many more agencies as well. Next next slide. This is actually an example workflow of our um, Monarch automation server product. Um, and what this product allows is for essentially data automation. Um, so we've basically built, mon built a model in our Monarch desktop product to transform United States Air Force IMDS report maintenance data. So there's maintenance data that comes out of the system. It's spit out in a report that you can see there as an example on the bottom left. Humans can understand it. We can understand the headers, the footers, the appends, you know, how things line up. Um, but a computer might not necessarily be able to do analytics on top of it. So we've built a model to change that data, that unstructured data, and put it into a tabular format. So turn it into rows and columns so that we can start to do more advanced analytics on top of it. In this particular case, we've taken that model and we've we've uploaded it into our automation server and we've actually built a, built a whole automated process around it where we're actually gonna monitor um, basically a network drive where those maintenance reports are dropped off and every time a new report comes, we're gonna run it through our model and then we're gonna provide a series of distributions on it like sending it to Tableau for visual analytics, archival, an archive location for auditing purposes maybe down the line, pushing it to a database or maybe just doing automated email report distribution. Um, so at 0900, the boss comes in, he has his maintenance report, he knows what parts may or may not fail, the probability behind them failing or not, and what aircraft he has available. Um, so this is just an example of something that you can take, uh, you know, very simple manual process and turn it into a very powerful business process automated process. Next slide. Speaking of data automation, um, the Naval Academy is a great use case for us. Um, every summer, their midshipmen go on training um, on different ships all across the world. Um, and that is obviously a logistics nightmare for uh, the human resource folks at the Naval Academy. This product or this process was previously managed by, managed by about 17 different spreadsheets. We were able to help them out uh, with the product that you just saw on the slide previously take all of those different data feeds, push them into one automated process so that they can get one report of the truth where all of their midshipmen are so they can make the best decisions on how to train our na the, the, the next generation of our naval officers. Next slide. So just real quick, the products that you'll see today first is Monarch. It's our desktop uh, self-service data prep product. Um, it allows you to take product or allows you to take data from virtually any, any type of source. 
Um, one of our separators in the marketplace, again, is our ability to deal with multi-structured, unstructured data sets, um, one of which we'll see today. Another big uh, part of this product that's uh, very valuable is data lineage uh, via what we call a change history. Uh, so you can, you have full auditability of what's happening to the data. So you could have 17 different data sources and a thousand different things happening to them. And somebody can easily understand one to a thousand what has happened to the data. So complete data lineage and there's an element of gov governance that that obviously leads to. Next slide. Altair Knowledge Hub is essentially the product that you just saw, Monarch, um, but it's available in the browser. It can be deployed in the cloud or on-prem, um, and it also has a collaborative mechanism that allows for enterprise usage. So you can share models with other folks, um, you can comment on models, um, and it really creates a data marketplace of not only raw data sets, but the actual models, exports, and commentary on top of those models as well. Next slide. Knowledge Studio is our advanced analytics product um, that allows folks to do things or use cases that revolve around predictive analytics, prescriptive analytics, AI or machine learning. Um, one of the things you'll see today is uh, our decision tree functionality, which is one of the things that we're known about. Um, and uh, really this is a product that's built for data analysts all the way to data scientists. Um, but it can really do some advanced uh, things and it is more of an advanced product that is meant for data scientists. Um, and one of the other things I will mention is it can integrate with R and Python code. So if you already have some code that you want to, you know, just use within this product and integrate, that's totally fine. We can import and export R and Python code. Uh, so fully integratable in that aspect. Next slide. The last product I'll talk about is our visualization product called Panopticon. Um, it not only allows you to, to build visuals on top of static data, but one something that's very special about this particular product is its ability to sit on top of actual real-time streaming data. And what I mean by that is message buses, tick databases, sensors, things like that, fast moving data down to the nanosecond so we can see the anomalies and make the decisions as fast as possible. Um, this product is actually very uh, well used across the financial markets um, on Wall Street, on the trade desks. Um, you can imagine, obviously, the data moves fast in, in, that, in that realm. Um, but that is all for me. Uh, in terms of slides, I'm going to hand it over to James, and hopefully you guys will like what you see live. Thank you, Dan. Um, today, we'll be taking a look at a few use cases, and we will see how Altair's Knowledge Works suite of products is used to leverage uh, or turn hard to read documents into meaningful reports and models. So, the first product, again, we're going to be taking a look at is going to be Monarch Complete version 15.5. We are currently viewing the initial user interface, so let's take a quick look at all the compatible data sources within Monarch. Scrolling from the top to bottom, we see that we have the ability to upgrade any previously built out models to the latest version of Monarch. Then we get into our semi-structured documents. These are going to be our PDF and text reports that we're looking to get into that structure, which is going to be our spreadsheets, right? Microsoft Excel, Google Sheets. Maintaining that structure, we can pull from a variety of different databases. It's worth noting we're, we're not limited to this list due to our ODBC and OLEDB connectivity. We can then pull data from different application sources, as well as a variety of different big data sources. And Monarch can even pull native tables from websites. So the first use case that we will be looking at deals with social media data and criminal investigation. I'll pull the PDF on screen so we can take a look at the actual data we're gonna be working with. So just starting from the top, this is a semi-structured PDF document. And this is the same format that Facebook would deliver if the FBI or the DOJ were to subpoena your Facebook account. This is a full record of somebody's Facebook account. And we can see the user information right here at the top. Our user is Mr. John Smith. Scrolling down, we're gonna see some shifting and changes in the format of the document. We see the different IP addresses here, different login times. As we scroll further on down, we're gonna see the different friends of Mr. John Smith, as well as the wall posts. So we are interested in extracting this wall post data and putting it into a usable format of rows and columns. In the past, this process would be very tedious, manually copying and pasting, rekeying all of this data into another platform such as Microsoft Excel. Not only would this process be very time consuming,
but you're also at risk of extracting in inaccurate data. With Monarch, we have found a better way to, quicker, to quickly and accurately extract this data and put it into the desired format that we are looking for. So I've already built out a model and I'll go ahead and show you what I mean. I'll click this prepare tab right here and we're gonna see some, a blank canvas right in front of us, but we're also gonna see some column headers, this change history on the right side and the presence of our model right here titled wall post info model. Since this has already been previously built out, I can just go to my file explorer, wherever that PDF resides, and I can simply drag and drop that into the model. And you can see we are going to automatically populate that table. So what we have built out here is considered a repeatable workspace, essentially a list of instructions on how to extract the data we are looking for when a PDF of the correct format is dropped into the model. Now, usually the next step for this use case is to bring in another table from a database consisting of a list of known persons of interest and matching that table up with this wall post data to see if the user of the Facebook account, Mr. John Smith, has been in contact with anyone of interest. However, we'd like to demonstrate the next product, Knowledge Hub, how this can be leveraged in a similar manner with some extra aspects of collaboration and governance that Dan just touched on. The first thing we're actually going to do is save this model and send this to my Knowledge Hub account. And we can perform the joining of the table and the database inside of that platform. I do this by going up to the top left corner, saving the workspace into Knowledge Hub. And then I can actually browse for whatever file. I see my folder right here. And I'm just going to go and drop this into my social media folder. As we can see, it's currently empty. I'll just click OK twice. And as you can see, we are now publishing that workspace into Knowledge Hub. So now that we have saved that, this Monarch desktop model in Hub, we can access this from any browser. This is why we like to say that Knowledge Hub is Monarch in a browser. So I'll go over that right now. Just gonna ask me to type in my login credentials. And right away, we can see that the initial user interface looks a little bit different. We have a couple of different windows here. This first one is just telling me any recent updates that were made. And we can see today at 3.51 p.m., which was just one minute ago, we have uploaded this social media demo workspace. I can also see if anything was ever shared with me right here, as well as this activity speed with my team, letting me know if there's been anything imported or exported up to our hub space together. Let's go browse in that library to see where that workspace was dropped. As you can see, I'm clicking into that social media folder and the workspace is present here. I'll click into this and we can see that this is the exact table that we were just viewing inside of Monarch desktop. So now that we can now, now what we're going to want to do is we're going to add that database, right? So I'll click this add data button up here at the top and I'll just bro browse on my local file. I'll open up this database and then I'll just save and open it. So now we have a new table consisting of two columns, a friend number and a friend name all in the same workspace with the other table. What we can do here is we can actually transform this with a join. I'll just go ahead and create this join of these two tables. And then the next step is to key in on which columns we'd like to match upon. That'll be our friend numbers, basically just our ID numbers. And then I'm gonna be left with some different options, on, you know, what other columns I'd like to bring with me to this next step. I'll bring the wall post text. So what we are doing speaks volumes to the power of Monarch and Knowledge Hub. This ability to join disparate data sources together to create a more refined and meaningful output is something that is difficult to do outside of our platform. I'll click apply. Now we can see just the fact that there's even a table that Mr. John Smith has actually been in contact with some of these people of interest. We can actually see the relationship with, if I click over from the grid to the flow, we can see these two tables being joined together to create one table. Thank you. Thank you, Dan and James. Uh, with Altair, that was a great presentation. I enjoyed that very much. And now on to the rest of the program. Thanks, Tom. Hi, this is uh, Jory Heckman. I'm a reporter with Federal News Network. Um, and I will be moderating over the next hour or so, uh, discussing the role of emerging technology in the federal emergency response. 
Um, you, we have plenty to talk about here, uh, and we have a great panel to discuss all of these issues. Um, you know, right off the bat, I just want to give you know some of my initial impressions of just how things are going, but we'll of course hear other perspectives on that. I think one big takeaway has really just been the IT investment. Uh, that is really paying off at, at some agencies. Um, you know, certainly we've seen with um, with the CARES Act and the tens of billion dollars that Congress has reinvested in agencies to double down on on things to enable telework, for example, and things like that. Uh, secondly, just being creative under pressure and and reassessing some of the work processes that are not possible right now. Just given everything that's happening and and the limitations of of who can and can't be in offices. And so those are my two main takeaways right now. But um, I'm going to throw it over to the panel in just a second. But before I do, uh, please do keep questions going on through the conversation. Don't wait until the very end to send those out. Uh, I will keep an eye on those and I'll field those out throughout the conversation. And we'll do our very best to make sure that we get to as many of those as possible. Uh, but that being said, I uh, just want to have the panelists have an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, and with that, I'm just going to throw it over to Mitch uh, over at the IRS. Mitch, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, we will take it from there. Great. Thank you, Jory. Just mic check, Jory. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yeah, I can hear um, you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Just wanted to check. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Mitch Winans from the IRS Office of the Chief Procurement Officer. Um, very sorry that I'm not on the video uh, function in the platform. I was uh, unable to get into it, but I'll be uh, um, trying to speak loud and clear through the audio only. Um, just want to say a big thank you to uh, ATARC for hosting this event and also um, to Jory for, for moderating it and look forward to the discussion with the other panelists. So. A um, little bit of background about me, I, um, I manage customer experience and strategic planning initiatives for the IRS Office of the Chief Procurement Officer. So I get involved with um, process improvements, performance enhancement, a lot of our stakeholder relations and engaging with our key customers. Um, and also, also as part of that, um, taking a look at integrating tools and technologies um, and uh, trying to automate processes wherever ever possible is, is a big part of that right now. So. Um, more more examples and, and things to share later, um, but I'll, I'll stop there and pass it back to Jory and the other panelists. Thank you, Jory. Great, great. And I'm going to pass it on over to Kathleen. Kathleen, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, please? Okay, great. Hi, everybody. I am Kathleen Mulch. I am a managing partner and principal analyst at a firm called Cognolytica. And we focus on both public and private sector um, companies. So we get to see a wide range of different levels of, uh, you know, AI adoption and AI awareness. Uh, in addition to that, I'm also a host of the very popular AI Today podcast. And I encourage everybody to listen to that if you haven't done so already. It gives a really good overview of different use cases on how people are implementing AI. We also talk about very broad topics such as MLOps, RPA, automation, and as well as the seven patterns of AI that we regularly talk about. Uh, so the autonomous pattern is one of them. And we say it's seven plus one because automation is not one of the patterns, but a lot of people in the federal government and elsewhere are using it as a stepping stone to get their data ready. I'm also a contributing writer to Forbes and Tech Target, where I contribute um, on a, a, about a weekly basis, different articles. And then I also host the AI and government event series. Mitch was actually a presenter at that a uh, few months ago, maybe September of 2019 which I know is a busy time for federal government. So we appreciated Mitch joining that. And then we actually have a, um, our next one coming up with Okimec from HHS on June 22nd. And ATARC is a partner of that for us. So um, I encourage everybody to attend that as well. And it, gives, it just helps us you know, bring together another platform for people to talk about how they are, the federal government and governments in general are adopting AI. Awesome. Thanks, Kathleen. And I'm going to turn it on over to uh, Rajiv over at USPTO. Uh, Rajiv, please uh, introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, I'm Raj Dolis. I hope you all can hear me properly. Um, I am 
uh, currently acting, not acting, I am a director of organizational policy and governance in USPTO, uh, work for the CIO. And my office it provides sh uh, shared services for um, DevSecOps, uh, the platform that is used for our CI CD platform, uh, deeply engaged in RPA activities, uh, software quality assurance, as well as policy and planning and performance improvement. I, uh, this is my first federal government gig. I've been here for about 20, since 2011 uh, in USPTO. Prior to that, I spent 20 odd years in private sector, mostly, uh, mostly in the financial sector in New York area. Excellent, thank you for that. And uh, I'm gonna turn it on over to Nick over at Pure Storage. Uh, Nick, please introduce yourself. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Nick Saki. I'm the principal system engineer for uh, North America's Federal with Pure Storage. And uh, very happy to have the opportunity to speak with you guys today about uh, artificial intelligence, the infrastructure tools, methods, and uh, successes that we've seen, particularly in the federal government space uh, around those, those endeavors. All right, excellent. Well, uh, everyone, thanks again for taking the time to to speak with me, and for everyone else uh, who's listening, thank you for taking the time. Um, you know, I think a good place to start the conversation uh, is just one with the recognition that in the federal space, uh, things like AI and automation can mean very different things depending on where you're talking about them. Um, but I think a good place to start is really. Um, you know, what are some natural first steps for AI and automation? And so, um, you know, Raj, I'll start with you with this very, you know, fundamental level question here. Uh, what do you see as some of the low hanging fruit for automation at your agency, at USPTO? So that's a very good question. There are lots of uh, opportunities, uh, lots of low hanging fruit for automation, uh, especially for robotic process automation. Um, there are, um, if you look at across the agency, there are many, many manual processes that we are engaged in today, where folks do road processes uh, day in and day out. And our goal uh, with the RPA, uh, uh, RPA platform set up and, and invocation of that is to offer services in, in a federated manner to the entire agency so that the development of RPA bots can happen anywhere uh, without any um, limitation or restriction, but eventually we bring it back into the fold where the governance is centralized, execution is centralized. Um, the main the main focus is really to look at processes that that are being executed by users, um, and then take it so that you automate them uh, from robotic process automation perspective. But at the same time, eventually we want to take them off of the user's computers and take them and put them in a centralized area where we can properly govern execution of these bots. Uh, we want to make sure that there's appropriate logging and authentication mechanism put in place, uh, as well as governance for ensuring that the bots are not running amok and doing things they should not be doing. Um, initially, the low hanging fruit is going to be our users using the bots on their laptop, making sure that the processes are getting automated and, and then eventually move them forward into a production environment. So robotic process automation is first, but then eventually we do want to get to, uh, to building intelligence behind this automation. Um, I know Kathleen has been uh, involved with some other questions with uh, the USPTO being involved in AI um, and um, there are some activities that are happening, but I'll predominantly focus on RPA today instead of going into AI and ML areas, if that's cool. Sure, of course. I mean, there is a wide spectrum from things as as uh, straightforward as machine learning, RPA, and then the other spectrum is more of the, I guess, more of the wishful thinking with AI right now. Um, but yeah, happy to have the conversation at that level. Um, with that being said, first of all, thank you, Raj. Um, but with that being said, let's toss it over to Kathleen. Uh, you, you got a little bit of a name check there, but from your perspective on things, where do you see the low hanging fruit? Sure. So, you know, it, it's interesting, like Raj said, uh, at Cognolytica, we have found that a, a lot of people within the federal agency, but also at companies as well are saying, you know, we want to improve processes and we want to help move things forward, but how do we go about doing that? 
And what are other examples that we can point to? So we've actually started to build a case repository to say, this is how other people are doing it. And the, this is how they've solved their problem. And maybe you can look to this as well. As Raj mentioned, we have been gathering some use cases from the USPTO around AI specifically, but they are you know, doing things with RPA as well. And Mitch on the panel um, did a very interesting use case with, um, with RPA for procurement and presented it. And then the Department of the Army heard about it and said, wow, I have the exact same need and I can bring this about at my agency as well. And so we've started to see more of that. And, and I'll let Mitch talk about that, um, where you know he saw that as, as a low hanging fruit for his agency, because it was something that they could implement, something that maybe didn't cost a lot of money, didn't require internal processes and tools and approvals that you know might be roadblocks. So anything that was going to produce immediate ROI, that could be money, that could be time savings, and will show that it actually has value. We say that's the low hanging fruit, start there. Start with something that's a pain point that takes a lot of time for somebody to do, but that you know is very important and needed. It's not a task that you know you automate, but maybe you didn't really need to at all be doing it. Make sure it's a task that you actually should be doing. And we've seen that that's, that's really you know a great place to start. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, and Mitch, I think that tees you up pretty well for uh, where you see things um, as far as low-hanging fruit over at the IRS. Sure. Thanks, Jory. And thanks for uh, uh, Kathleen mentioning that and great, great comments so far. Yeah. So I think uh, um, one thing that just for context that we try to do in the IRS Chief Procurement Office is continually assess and scan an organization, try to take a look at what we're doing well what we're not doing so well, and which areas we need to target for improvement. Well, while we're doing that, we try to keep a few questions or key goals in mind. Uh, for example, how can we better support our employees' experience and make their jobs easier and more impactful? How can we drive greater efficiencies in our, our procurement operations? Uh, how can we look ahead to the future of work and the, uh, support changing needs and future needs of our employees and our organization? And then also, how do we make sure that we're aligning with some of those broader IRS strategic goals and some of those government-wide initiatives, things in the President's Management Agenda, and CAP goals, things like that. So, um, so as a result of that, um, we started looking at procurement processes that could potentially benefit um, from some type of automation. Um, so the example that Kathleen uh, mentioned was we decided to start with a process called contractor responsibility determinations. Um, in a nutshell, it's a, it's a standard uh, procurement compliance check before any new contract is awarded, we have to verify that firm's suitability for work. Um, in order to do that, um, employees need to check several public databases and search for public information and check for a few, uh, ask a few key questions basically, check for red flags. For example, is the company suspended or debarred? Do they have a satisfactory record of performance? Um, satisfactory record of business integrity and ethics? Are they in compliance with various laws and executive orders? Uh, things like that. So it's a very, very important um, critical process for being good stewards of tax dollars, uh, but it's highly manual, uh, highly redundant, and highly time consuming to complete by hand. Uh, depending on the employee and their, and their workload and the situation, it usually takes um, about two hours for an employee to do it manually. Um, so what we did was we developed a bot um, that automates that process end to end um, in only about five minutes. So taking a process that normally uh, takes an employee two hours and, and automate uh, using a bot instead that can automate the process end to end um, just by using an email and sending some key information to the bot. Um, so that's an example of something that just really, um, it's a well-documented rules-based process. So, so Jory, your question about what are the lowest hanging fruit, I think in general, um, the rules-based well-documented processes are a great place to start for federal agencies. Uh, the procurement field has has quite a bit of those, um, but so do other areas in um, financial management, legal, and IT, and um, uh, HR across the board. Um, so that's a great place to start because I think you can really demonstrate that ROI um, pretty quickly with a, a small amount of money and a small amount of time. Um, and some of those key ROI factors that we've we've benefited from so far are reducing the time burden on our staff is huge, but it's also uh, the bot has helped us uh, increase compliance. Uh, it's really helped us get better and more consistent reporting. Um, which is helpful just for our contract files and our audit trail. 
Um, and then, and then beyond that, it was really just the um, help spearhead our um, learning opportunities to explore automation capabilities, and then also kind of what leads into more um, sophisticated tools and technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and natural language processing and some other things that are helping the uh, the popcorning of ideas at our organization. So, um, so yeah, thank you, Kathleen, for mentioning that. And Jory, that's uh, just one example. I'll pass it back to you. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Mitch. And Nick, uh, why, why don't we uh, hear from you and, and your perspective on where you see the low-hanging fruit in the uh, the federal space? So thanks, Jory. I, well, the simple things are always hard, but in this uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really given us some pretty tremendous opportunities for validating that the data strategy and data implementation are aligned with uh, the infrastructure necessary to support uh, the AI initiatives within federal government agencies. Um, so this gives us an opportunity to verify and validate that the infrastructure we have and the data processes that we have are, are actually fundamentally valid. This is also an opportunity for us to reinforce uh, gaps that we may have in the necessary uh, IT and personnel infrastructure resources to drive agency AI and ML opportunities. It also gives us a chance to assess whether or not we're asking the right questions or we're attempting to answer them in the right way. Are we using the right, to, to borrow Kathleen's excellent uh, seven patterns paradigm, are we using the right patterns to answer the questions? So we should be paying very close attention uh, to how data service and storage are, are aligned and supporting the massive increases in available quantities and types of data that we have. Um, since the other thing we wanna be mindful of is since data is useful and persistent in AI and ML contexts, far beyond the initial collection point, our new algorithms can be trained using more up-to-date and larger quantities of data, we want to make sure that the, that our ability to support and sustain that um, is, is built in from the outset. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at are our processes valid, are our methodologies, our, our infrastructure all um, supportive of the agency's goals and objectives. And, and while that all sounds really easy, I mean, having a data strategy or refining that data strategy in light of the, you know, the current events is not easy because you're simultaneously trying to manage a crisis or manage a massive increase in, in workload uh, while also trying to understand, you know, are our processes and our tools both efficient and effective? Is our workforce capable of adapting to or leveraging uh, the tool sets that we have? And how do we build better tools or ask better questions or better models for, uh, for learning in this context? All right. Thank you, Nick, for, for all those observations. Um, and I think that really does set us up for the next uh, question here. Uh, this really is a conversation that's taking place in the context of uh, the pandemic really shaking up some work processes. Uh, and this is really a time and a place where Federal, federal agencies are all hands on deck, uh, dealing with a workload that is, I think, unprecedented. Uh, with that being said, um, how does AI, how does automation serve as a force multiplier during the pandemic? Uh, Raj, why don't we toss it over to you uh, for the, for, to answer the question first? So USPTO has always had a very strong telework program, uh, even before the pandemic hit. A um, number of our employees work from home uh, completely. So the the extension of uh, uh, teleworking option to remaining employees, well, it was it was not a heavy lift for USPTO. Um, and automation has always been at the forefront of our IT modernization at, at PTO. So for example, in the RPA um, program that we started, it started last year, uh, well before anything, you know, the current situation occurred, uh, way before um, RPA was a buzzword uh, or AI ML were buzzwords for most of the agencies. Uh, so AI ML, RPA, all these activities began last year in USPTL. So as far as the pandemic goes, really the impact on our automation efforts has been minimal. Our automation efforts were always there. We're continuing to execute on those. And automation doesn't limit to um, what we can accomplish through AI ML or RPA. 
Automation is also um, accomplished through other processes, such as in software development and software deployment. We have been at the forefront of having a DevSecOps platform and having a continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline of all the products that we develop, um, and next generation products that we develop, so that there is an auto, so there is automation components built into all of those things as we as we uh, progress through software development. Uh, RPA is something that we're also looking at in integrating in our uh, CI/CD platform. Uh, we don't want to treat RPA, the bot development process, as an offshoot and treat it differently. We want to integrate into the RPA development lifecycle into our CI/CD platform. Uh, we're looking to make sure that you know this is new. This is a new area, so we want to make sure that uh, all the appropriate solutions are available to us, or if not, we develop products or solutions internally that allow us automation from our BA perspective as well. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Mitch, you know, I think you had said in your opening remarks, um, just what a time saver uh, the bots that IRS has fielded has been. Um, I know that's always the value proposition uh, with automation and with RPA is just the times uh, the time saved uh, from the workforce doing these manual tasks. Um, but is there is there any other force multiplying effect right now that the IRS is benefiting from with uh, with automation? Yeah, thanks, Jory. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, certainly the um, the time savings is is huge. Um, also, the financial savings is is huge when you think about. Um, the level of certain em employees and the amount of time that they have to spend on some of these um, very manual, repetitive, um, time-consuming processes. Um, it really does uh, highlight that. Um, but for, for us, I think right now, um, going through a, a, a pandemic or any kind of unprecedented situation or crisis, um, it's very challenging. Uh, I think it's, it's very uh, um, distracting, if you will. Um, and, and there's also uh, several new requirements, uh, things things coming uh, at our employees that they need to, to be able to quickly pivot and focus on. Um, you know, for example, with the COVID-19, IRS has a very large uh, role to play with the uh, economic impact um, payments going out to taxpayers. Um, and so lots of those uh, requirements um, uh, involve different procurements and contract support for that. Um, there's also the normal tax filing season would have expired on April 15th. Uh, this year it was extended until July 15th. So again, uh, the tax filing season that's normally three months um, was extended to almost six months, half the year. So the doors are open a lot longer, um, if you will. And, and, and again, I mentioned that because it, uh, many of those um, requirements for the agency also require um, some additional contract support and making sure that we have the, the tools and resources and services to support that. So. Um, being able to rely on any any type of tool um, that can help make our employees' uh, lives easier and their jobs easier is key. Um, so just thinking about um, you know some of the some of the use cases where where automation really um, really is 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 ideal, um, reducing some of those you know common tasks such as queries, uh, data polls, those cut and paste functions, the data merging, all those things that are um, not not the strategic high value um, activities that we want and need our employees to focus on. Right now we need them to um, focus on uh, customer engagement, um, industry outreach, really kind of seeing what capabilities exist in the marketplace, what are some of those key trends, and what are the challenges and pain points that our industry partners are experiencing as well right now and they're trying to understand some of these new uh, contract requirements and opportunities and respond to them quickly in a high quality fashion. Um, mentoring employees and just uh, there's a, a lot of uh, with the increase in the telework environment there's a big need for us to be able to, to better mentor uh, um, and kind of communicate and engage with our employees and just check on everybody and make sure that we're doing all right so I think there are some some of those key um, measures of, of ROI um, that we think of of course the time saved and the dollars saved um, the increased compliance, things like that. But then there's also some of those uh, intangible benefits that we're really seeing right now um, just to provide some relief for employees and to help improve their experience and their experience for our customers. So uh, it's a great question, uh, Joy. I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. 
Great. Thanks, Mitch. And uh, Nick, you know, we've we've approached this from a lot of different angles, the the time saved, uh, the money saved with automation and RPA and, and all these things you can couch under automation, this very large umbrella. Um, but, you know, are there are we any are there any other facets to this value proposition that we're missing? Is there any other way to really kind of, you know, quote unquote, sell this idea uh, across the federal space? should uh, take myself off mute. So I'd say that across the federal space, we are seeing a definite acceleration in AI and ML implementation, uh, especially pattern analysis and modeling for things like you know, virology, contact tracing, uh, the financial analysis for fraud or economic delivery that you know the IRS is certainly assessing. And, the, and one of the things that we wanna point out is that we, we've actually come some ways to the utility of AI and ML to our day-to-day -day lives. The breathtaking speed with which the virus was genetically sequenced as an example is a testament uh, to the power of modern computing and analytics. Um, and, and analyzing the huge volume, velocity, and variety of contact tracing and modeling is another one of those things where the data sets are so vast and so fast moving that AI and ML is utterly essential for understanding how, how the population is moving and how the virus may be spreading. In order, now the utility of that and the value of that is it provides us with an outstanding opportunity um, to potentially allow us to get ahead of the spread and, and allow us to position, for example, healthcare resources in, in advance of their actual needs. So if we can make reasonable inferences backed by data, and really this is one of those things that AI does exceptionally well for us, we can start putting the resources where they're going to be needed as opposed to uh, reacting to where the resources are needed now, but we can't get them there in a timely fashion. In other words, we're getting to the left of the bang. So the predictive analytic capabilities of AI and ML have vast applicability, especially as you know data now moves at network speed. And we've already heard from a couple of agencies how even having bots and tool chains and algorithms that are able to do all of the necessary searching and correlation of data for a given query reduces the, you know, the amount of time that a, that a user or an analyst um, spends sitting around and waiting or hunting and pecking and gophering. So these are all you know, applications of AI that help make us more effective. And I think that we're seeing this really borne out in practice um, across a vast swath of our federal government agencies, our state and local education, our state and local agencies, and in academia and higher education. All right, very good. Thank you for that, Nick and uh, Kathleen. You know, we we've heard a lot of uh, compelling use cases here uh, just now with with AI and RPA and all these things, um, but you know, looking from your perspective across the space, um, what do you see as maybe some of the the common elements or some of the the common through lines to a uh, successful deployment of, uh, of, of automation and machine learning. What are some, maybe, maybe what are maybe some of the, the lessons learned in all of this? Yeah, that's a good Iterate often. Uh, we, we do also like to stress that automation is incredibly useful, but it really takes repetitive tasks and repeats them. So if you have tasks that, you know, like Mitch said earlier, like that, where it's very manual, can be error prone. Automation is not intelligence, though. So you really need to bring in those cognitive AI and machine learning. So we always, that's why we bring up the seven patterns, because we always say, that it's important to not confuse automation and intelligence, and then to make sure you know what pattern or patterns you're implementing. So we've talked a lot about predictive analytics, and we've seen some great use cases with that. We've also seen chatbots, how they can be incredibly helpful. Uh, the USPS has implemented chatbots, and so it allows the chatbot to be a first line of you know defense for that agency where that can that chatbot is able to have the first interaction with humans and maybe help them through the process. We Emma, and Emma actually is able to help walk people through the website 
because it, you know the process of becoming a citizen in theory may not be that difficult but in practice there's a lot of steps it can be very time consuming and it's also incredibly stressful for those people so it helps you know walk them through their website make sure they're doing everything answer their questions and then if they'd like to they can also call in to a customer service uh agent so we've seen that you know with our mission and our goals and move forward. Excellent, thank you for that, Kathleen. Uh, just moving on and changing gears here a little bit. Uh, Raj, I think you'd mentioned earlier in the conversation, uh, just the the goal of really moving the agency more towards uh, bots on laptops and and greater, I think, flexibility uh, with uh, with automation and machine learning and things of that nature. Um, I think that's uh, that's certainly exciting to see that play out, maybe in the the near term. But I do think that a conversation that's going on right now is just striking this balance between uh, authentication and access uh, versus utility. I mean, these bots, they don't, they can run 24 seven if they really wanted to. Um, but of course, you know, things like identity management and, and making sure that they, uh, you know, they don't veer off too far, too far off course is another consideration. So, um, the question I have for you, Raj, is just how do you strike that balance between identity management and automation uh, as you're as you're work as you're working through this in the the short term? Awesome question. Uh, we are actually uh, looking at that right now, uh, and that's why I mentioned earlier that in the initial uh, deployments of the bots that we develop, we are going to limit them to run them on users' laptops. So users, users have control on the bot that they execute and when they execute. That way we can manage and monitor usage patterns of the bots that are on the users' laptops or users' computers. And they are married to the user who is on the laptop with the identity of the laptop and the user associated with it. So we have a little bit of a control at that in, in this manner. But as we move forward, our intent is to move the, the bots from the laptops to centralized location and run them in an, uh, what we call unattended mode. So we want the bots to be triggered by events that occur, um, either, either by events that occur or on some kind of schedule. So when we get into that mode, it is going to be incredibly important that we know which bot was triggered by what, uh, which bot was executed at what time through a, a nightly process or a scheduled process, and what did the bot really do? So the observability of the bot, the identity management around the bot, these are all crucial topics that we, we need to resolve, we should resolve before the bot sprawl hits us. And the bot sprawl is going to hit us, we know that, because we're in a federated development model. We have a federated development model. We know that lots of our users are, are uh, aspiring to develop their own bots and deploy them on their own laptops. But in the, in the long run, that, that, that will change and we'll have a better governance. We intend to have better governance around the model of bot execution. All right. Some very exciting stuff there in the works there, Raj. Thank you for that answer. Uh, and, and Mitch, I'd like to turn it over to you just maybe as, uh, as just maybe a little bit of a, uh, clarification on, on how the bots are positioned at IRS. Um, you had mentioned that they're triggered by something as simple as an email uh, to get the, the those uh, work processes in motion. But just tell me a little bit better uh, how the bots are deployed over at IRS. Sure. Thanks, Jory. So yeah, that, that example for our um, contractor responsibility uh, determination bot, yeah, the, the trigger point for that bot is, uh, is an email. So what the employee does is all they have to do is um, open up a standard standard email, their uh, IRS email account, um, type in the email address for the bot, simple subject uh, um, code, and then they type in the DUNS number for the company that they want to search. The DUNS number is a data universal numbering system. It's a standard identifier for any company that's trying to uh, um, do business with the government or other entities. 
Um, and then they send off the, the email to the bot. And then within five minutes, that bot is checking a couple uh, public databases, um, uh, checking for some of those red flags, um, doing all of that, the uh, um, mimicking basically the the human behavior, you know, the 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 clicking, the typing, the copying, pasting, reading, scanning, downloading, and compiling everything into a streamlined report, and then emailing it back to the contracting officer and doing all of that within um, within five minutes. So, um, so that that's how that that particular bot works. Um, one of the reasons that uh, um, that we got started with that one, I know uh, Raj had some great feedback to that question about. Um, kind of balancing um, automation with, uh, you know, identity management or, or some of the um, data access, privacy, things like that. One of the reasons that we started with this bot, um, kind of in line with what Kathleen mentioned, that's a great motto of uh, start small, think big, and iterate often. Um, we started with this one because it is a lower risk area, and it, uh, the bot's only accessing um, publicly available information. So it didn't require any access to IRS systems or um, PII or federal tax information or anything like that. Um, so it didn't involve or require any uh, credentialing or authentication. Um, there are certainly benefits uh, that we could see in the future of kind of enhancing the bot and, and having it um, have greater access to IRS systems, um, like our contract writing system or even um, other uh, um, government-wide systems like uh, CPARs for past performance evaluation. So there are certainly things that we're, we're exploring with that, but that was kind of a key part of the um, approach was, okay, let, let's try to start start small with a low risk area. Um, this is a big learning opportunity for us. I think uh, one of the key things with uh, looking at automation and different types of artificial intelligence um, technologies is that every agency is at a different stage of their journey um, or phase of their evolution. I think we're very early in our journey um, at IRS, not only in the procurement um, organization, but also other parts of the IRS. Um, but this is a priority, and it is something that we're committed to um, intelligently exploring and, and adopting and integrating into our operations um, well, whenever we can to help us do our jobs better and fulfill the mission. So I think those are just uh, some, some key things about the way that we look at um, automation and AI at the IRS. All right. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, and Kathleen, you know, I, I want to ask you uh, a similar but different question. Um, we have been talking about this in the context of, of crawl, walk, run, uh, start small and, and then build up from there from what is successful and, and maybe scrapping what doesn't work. But uh, turning back again to the context of, of this being an emergency, this being a pandemic, um, I, I think, you know, elsewhere we've seen the the need for IT investments to to ramp up and scale up uh, faster than maybe they were originally intended to. Um, with that being said, you know, does this in any way change the the trajectory of of this AI machine learning journey in government? And and if so, how? You know, we've started to see a lot of different agencies thinking about automation. I think that that's super important because they need to have different processes in place and you know have their data usable and so automation is a great place to start when you're trying to implement an ai project implementation can be a lot quicker and you can see immediate ROI. With AI projects, you need to make sure that your data is in a usable state because garbage in is garbage out. So make sure that it's usable. So we've seen, you know, different agencies say, okay, AI was a priority before. We want to keep it a priority now, but we haven't seen them rush through projects. All right. All right. Excellent. And, and Nick, you know, in a slightly different context here, um, for maybe some of the agencies that had a late start to this, uh, it maybe seemed daunting to get on this AI machine learning journey. And, and now, especially so with everything else that's going on, um, maybe, maybe approach the, the, the topic from that perspective of of agencies that may feel a little overwhelmed right now uh you know how how do they see the forest for the trees here and and navigate this in this very tricky time 
Well, this is this is a, a good opportunity. Well, and there's your answer. So the uh, I think that this gives a, agencies who haven't yet or are behind schedule on adopting their AI strategies uh, now have an opportunity to see who's been successful and uh, who's struggled. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to understand, particularly in the context of public-private partnerships, who's got things that are really working well, who's got processes. Uh, tool chains, algorithms, infrastructure that are are really working well. So it, it is a way to actually de-risk um, the the bets on what an agency wants to do and the tools that they'd want to do it with. So I think that that you know there's opportunity in uh, in these kinds of challenges that help us assess with real data. Uh, who's been successful and uh, and who still needs to work. But but most importantly, to identify what's going to work best for any given agency's uh, data problems and, and really aspirations around the implementation of RPA, AI, and ML. All right. Thank you for that, Nick. Uh, and, and Mitch, uh, I want to ask you uh, an IRS-specific question. I know uh, in the past you've spoken about the success of, of pilot IRS, I think is what's, uh, what's it's called, of just how the IRS is uniquely fielding things like automation. Uh, just give us all a little bit of a quick overview of how that's been going. Sure. Thanks, Jory. I'm glad, glad that you asked that. Um, no, thank you. So, um, so one of the things that um, we're trying to do in the uh, IRS procurement office is um, really kind of recognizing that across the government, it's very hard to test and scale um, things um, for a variety of reasons uh, um, and, and some of the great points that, um, that Nick was making. It, it is it's difficult to do that, and this is really a key opportunity for us to right now kind of um, kind of understand what are some of the pain points across government, but also look at some of the bright spots and some of the opportunities. So one thing we're trying to do specifically and the um, IRS procurement office uh, is is uh, make sure we're doing our part in procurement to enable some of that um, modernization and some of that innovation. So, what we've done is we uh, we have created a, a new initiative called Pilot IRS, um, and it's essentially a streamlined acquisition and phased funding approach for quickly identifying, testing, and deploying emerging technology um, across the IRS. So, for an agency like IRS that does not have um, R and D authority or special um, um, uh, contract uh, tools that you may see at DOD or DHS or energy. Um, it, it allows us to um, really kind of promote innovative responses to IRS challenges, uh, broadly communicate some of those challenges and, and technology areas that interest the IRS the most, and then also gives us a streamlined progression from uh, concept to prototype to actual testing and a scaled deployment um, and maybe a full, full deployment if uh, um, if it's proven to be successful. So our first, uh, one of our first projects under that that I'll highlight um, is our Data Act Improvements Project. Um, the Data Act, it stands for the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act of 2014. Uh, it's a piece of legislation that requires federal agencies to report on their financial and non-financial um, data that's in their contract awards. Um, so in other words, all the information that comes from a, an, an agency and goes into the federal procurement data system um, next gen. So um, it's, a, it's a very important uh, compliance and transparency um, mandate for, for federal agencies um, that really involves the contracting team and the, and the uh, CFO or financial management team. Um, but there are a, a, a large number of data elements that are required to, uh, to be reported on. I think there's 56 different data elements. And um, uh, very, very, again, very time consuming, very manual, very redundant, repetitive process, and uh, often lots of opportunities for errors. Looking at data from disparate systems, they feed into each other in different formats at different times, um, different types of data. So what we did under our pilot IRS framework was created this Data Act Improvements Project with uh, um, three goals, to look at technologies that could help us achieve three goals. How do we improve the quality and accuracy of our IRS procurement data and the federal procurement data system? How do we limit the amount of manual work or rework that's required by our employees to identify and correct these errors? And then how do we achieve incremental improvement um, very, very quickly? 
um, and with this phased approach. So um, we've had a tremendous amount of success uh, so far with this particular project. Um, in a nutshell, we're exploring a couple different types of um, technologies that'll that'll help us identify and correct errors. Um, specifically, it's a it's a mixture of um, robotic process automation and also uses uh, some machine learning um, and or another one uses natural language processing to help us identify and correct these errors. Um, right now, for example, we're in the process of correcting um, approximately 175 um, errors related to um, a contract award date. Um, you wouldn't think that's, a, that's an error, but it is actually a very common error as far as what's the date on a contract award document versus what's the date on a, uh, in a contract writing system versus what's the date that gets reported to um, the federal procurement data system as, as an example of all the different systems that have to be touched. Um, also, a specific COVID-19 um, example, um, since the pandemic was announced in mid-March, we've been able to pivot this tool that we're, again, still testing and then evaluating and exploring. It's in a very early stage. Um, but we were able to um, have the, uh, the tool focus on COVID-19 related um, data elements. There's some special data elements that federal procurement organizations are required to report on, uh, to report on excuse me, um, if they're dealing with a COVID-19 requirement. Um, it's the same kind of thing we have when there's other na uh, national emergencies like a hurricane or a flood or something like that. Um, anyway, so the, um, uh, the, the, the bot, the tool has been able to identify um, hundreds of errors and it's already been able to um, correct, I think of the recent iteration that corrected 63 specific COVID-19 data elements um, that are fed into the federal procurement data system. And each correction takes less than a tenth of a second. Um, so again, each correction takes less than a tenth of a second. I, I can't even think of anything I can do in my life in, in that short of time. So, um, so very, very uh, promising technology that can really help us with um, compliance and, and reporting and uh, um, early consistency for audit trails with this and really helping promote greater transparency for our financial data that's in our contract awards. So um, again, lo uh, lo lots, of, uh, um, lots of successes so far and then lots of opportunities um, and ideas for us for the future. So thanks for asking about that, Drew. I know we could talk about that uh, quite a bit, so I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Excellent. Glad to hear things are working out very well there. Um, we're running low on time. Uh, Kathleen, maybe we'll we'll give you the closing sentiment here. Uh, we've been hearing where things are going over at the IRS. We've been hearing what thing, where things are going at USPTO. Uh, a lot of exciting use cases here, but um, what what should we look for in, in the short term as far as uh, the, the cutting edge of machine learning and, and AI and RPA uh, in the federal space? Yeah, that's a great question. And I switched to phone in case anybody is looking for me on camera. So hopefully this audio is a lot better. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot of agencies on both a federal level and also a state and local level looking at RPA and automation. And we're really excited about what's coming from that. We're also seeing, I think, that a lot more agencies now uh, at all levels are thinking about chatbots and how they can utilize chatbots to help them, uh, you know, continue to be engaging to their constituents and help get their mission to move forward while also not having to have people there to power those chatbots and help answer certain questions. So that's one thing that we're really looking forward to and seeing a lot more people think about at all levels of government. Excellent, excellent. And, and Nick, I don't want to exclude you in this conversation either. Uh, your Maybe your closing sentiments on, on where you'd like to think, see things go from here. So I, I think that from my perspective, I look forward to uh, advancements in uh, across all of the areas of AI and ML adoption from the, the technology, uh, the policy, the processes, the enhancement of algorithms, the understanding of what we can do with this, particularly now that we are test driving it in earnest in, in critical areas in our society. Um, so I think that we're going to see some pretty significant advancements and our, our understanding of what AI and ML can do for us, as well as the technology that enables us to get there. Um, 
it is uh, it is a very interesting time to see this the dawn of this technology, particularly in light of you know, where we sit as as a as a nation, and really as humanity. Excellent. Well, I think that's all the time we have for right now. Um... Everyone, you know, panelists, thank you so much for, for taking the time to to outline all of this, what's going on here in this space. Uh, and yeah, I, uh, tune in next time. Um, but until then, I think that's all the time we have. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Tom Suter. I'm the founder of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. And we're here for a panel on artificial intelligence in your agency to ensure mission success. And today we have with us Nick Saki, who's the Principal Systems Engineer at Pure Storage with us today. How are we doing today, Nick? Doing great. Thanks for having me today, Tom. Yep, looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks. Well, very excited to have the opportunity to talk today about using artificial intelligence in federal government agencies uh, to improve agency support um, constituent services and mission operations. We've had, uh, we've seen a tremendous uh, uptake in adoption of artificial intelligence technologies and certainly a tremendous interest um, across the federal government as a whole in the Department of Defense in particular. We've seen the establishment of, uh, you know, commands uh, of agencies specifically focused on developing and deploying artificial intelligence. We've seen it implemented across the entire spectrum of the federal government and, and broadly also across a lot of the, uh, the state and local governments as well. But we've gotten past a lot of the initial level setting questions around, you know, an AI strategy and a data strategy. And all of these things are really fundamental to enabling uh, the implementation and the effective implementation of artificial intelligence in government organizations, just truly like the adoption of, of any advanced technology. We've also seen that it is no longer theoretical, that it's actual, uh, actually a practical uh, and real capability that agencies can leverage in order to um, support their, their efforts, whether it's, you know, obviously, you know, taxpayers and revenue or um, Department of Defense operations, intelligence community, et cetera. But there are, there are still a lot of, of significant challenges ahead of a lot of agencies as these, uh, these efforts come out of the laboratory or out of the, the pilot and proof of concept stage and into uh, a production or deployment uh, type of environment. Um, so what we see is uh, there's a lot of questions or challenges around what type of technology to implement, how you implement it at scale, what types of applications are suitable for implementing an artificial intelligence or implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning at scale. Um, people, the availability of people, where do you get the expertise? What do, what skill sets need to be um, developed in the workforce or brought into the workforce and are able to uh, get the most out of the, an agency's artificial intelligence efforts. And I think I really want to sort of take these things in that kind of a, of a track. You know, first and foremost, you've got to identify what it is you want to do or what you hope to accomplish with an AI strategy. And at the outset, a lot of this has been uh, tackling repetitive, uh, large-scale data operations, if you will. So the federal government generates data in quantities, uh, volume, variety, and uh, and velocity that many people don't really fully appreciate. But a lot of this data, for example, you know, camera imagery is, is agonizing. It takes a tremendous amount of time to, for an individual to look through uh, streams and streams and streams of video. But it is actually a task that, as an example, computers are really good at. Uh, so just doing machine learning or computer vision, I should say, in machine learning to start identifying uh, relevant contextual information in video streams or, or massive collections of still frame imagery has become a very popular use case. And we've, you know, we've been pretty successful in helping agencies uh, leverage that for everything from cancer research to, um, to intelligence and uh, battlefield surveillance. Um, but getting, getting a sense of what is in the art of the possible is also, uh, I've seen federal agencies do a tremendous job working with industry and academia to tackle these kinds of challenges because while the specific outcome of a given AI application may be particularly specific to that agency, the computer technology underneath it is actually um, rather 
um, broadly available and broadly utilized. So everything from the algorithms to the actual hardware themselves are often portable. Um, so you can, you know, the government's done a good job of identifying best practices and most successful implementations in companies like Page AI and Facebook and others and, and bringing that expertise or those application uh, skill sets in house to apply to the government's problems. Um, this also sort of at, at the outset underscored something that the initial pilot efforts may have been built off of like a single GPU platform or, you know, fairly robust, uh, but pre existing legacy architecture and that sort of introduced another challenge. The infrastructures of yesterday were really designed to do much more uh, generalized types of computing at a much smaller scale in terms of overall uh, parallelization, uh, the breadth and number of processes that were simultaneously trying to process data was, was very different in the classic, you know, database and server virtualization type of architecture. But in artificial intelligence, the need for massive parallelization has really driven everybody towards a, a technology baseline that focuses on distributed and parallelized compute, now, largely using things like GPUs and tensor processing units and things of that nature, because you have so many different processes working simultaneously, answering segments of the problem in parallel. Well, that poses a tremendous strain on legacy infrastructure. So companies like mine have been forced, not forced, but really moved to develop uh, a technology baseline, a framework that is, that is built for artificial intelligence type applications. And we've seen the popularity of that emerge, particularly as large organization and government uh, AI efforts have started to expand beyond the laboratory or the, the testing phase and into the real training development and production phase. So we're seeing you know, tremendous increase in the requirements for bandwidth, a huge increase in the amount of compute required. And really you start seeing these, these large scale disaggregated architectures where compute networking and storage are managed as separate components to, to facilitate um, the easy and rapid scaling of the technology infrastructure to support the actual work. And then when we start taking a look at skill sets as well, um, we've seen the rise of, an, of a really different kind of specialist, the, the data scientist, and uh, the rise in a different kind of uh, infrastructure engineer and administrator. They're, they're two different kinds of things. A data scientist is really figuring out not only how to ask the questions, but what can the data tell them and then how to get the answers out of these vast data sets. And, it, um, and on the infrastructure side, obviously, when, you're, when you start talking about managing your on-premises architecture as if it were a large scale cloud, it's a different way of thinking about uh, the architecture itself. It literally is that as a service type of capability where you've got networking, you've got compute, and you've got data service, uh, and these things get managed but loosely coupled to each other via the applications and application programming interfaces. So it really becomes a, a uh, an almost loose coupling of technology components that get dynamically allocated as the application needs change. And with artificial intelligence, a lot of times that becomes self-servicing. Uh, so API-driven automation and AI API-driven infrastructure become integral to and fundamental to the success of AI platforms, especially as they start to get larger and larger. So, you know, if you think about this in, in a sort of structural way, the first thing you do is develop an automation strategy. Uh, you have your data, you have a data management strategy, and you have a sense of the types of things you want to do with that data. So then you have to develop an automation strategy of processing that data, refining the data and preparing that data for utilization in the AI framework. And you apply the people to uh, tailoring the data operations and the infrastructure operations to support those outcomes. And eventually you have the core nucleus of technology and people necessary and process necessary to start actually applying the technology against the problem set for the desired mission or agency outcome. So does all that sort of make sense? There's a lot of broad strokes there. Um, the short version is as well, some of the stuff is new. In truth, it's, it's really a growth in the same types of technical, ca technical capabilities and capacities that we've evolved over the last 60 years. It's just the scale is now much greater. The velocity of the data is much higher. And we're, we're adapting as, as we always do to making the tools uh, deliver the results that we would like to obtain from them.
That's great, Nick. If I can ask a real quick follow-up question, sure. where do you see the federal government over the next uh, one or two buying seasons? Where, where are we, where are we, where are we going to see some near-term uh, success? I think we're going to see a couple of things. We're going to see um, in-house capability brought on board to start addressing the the test and dev or the the pilot and proof of concept phases, um, and then. Uh, a continuous iteration and continuous development or CICD um, software engineering and AI training mechanism that will very often probably be deployed into a, a shared infrastructure or a cloud type of environment. But I think we'll see the capability development happens in house and then the deployment into production will probably happen in large scale, either government owned or contractor owned uh, cloud environments uh, for deployment into the real world. So I think we're going to see a huge increase in cloud spending, particularly around artificial intelligence. And we're going to see a fairly large change in the consumption patterns for on-premises infrastructure as well. And the mandate to ensure that they work together. Very important. That's all the time we have. Uh, thank you, Nick, uh, Principal Systems Engineer for, Engineer for Pure Storage, Nick Saki. Thank you, Nick, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Tom. You too.